Non, je disais qu'on était content d'avoir euh, Yann, qui est un euh, professeur ici depuis huit euh, depuis ans, qui est un expert de topologie, qui s'est fait connaître, euh, entre autres, comme étant la, le, donc, de publier le premier article avec une application concrète des isolants topologiques. Les gens hein, disaient toujours, oh, ça va servir, ça va servir, mais finalement, c'est... Euh, c'est lui avec Marcel France qui, qui l'ont fait. Et puis, il s'est beaucoup intéressé aussi à l'effet de l'influence de des électrons sur les phonons. Et c'est ce dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui. D'accord. Merci, André-Marie. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Normally, in the beginning of the talk, one is supposed to thank the the person who invited me, but I actually I invited myself. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I do thank uh, you for, for being there. And also to, I thank the other speakers of this RQMP series. Uh, I enjoyed learning about what people are doing around, around the three, three poles. So the title of my talk is uh, Topology in Heritage, uh, Influence of the Electronic Verifaces in Phonons. And hopefully by the end of the hour, uh, this, talk, uh, this title would make some sense. So here's the uh, outline of my talk. Uh, because I'm speaking to a broad audience, uh, I'll spend quite a bit of time giving some tutorial uh, for the uh, very phase and also lattice vibrations. And then uh, uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, I'll give three examples on how uh, the electronic very phase can influence uh, phonon properties, specifically the phonon effective charge, uh, the sound dispersion, and the phonon angular momentum. And I'll conclude with some uh, brief conclusions. So please feel free to, uh, to interrupt and ask questions. So let's begin with the Berry phase. Uh, here on the right, you can see uh, Sir Michael Berry, who, who is certainly delighted at, delighted at the fact that uh, a 1983 paper that he wrote uh, influenced uh, many fields of physics. So uh, what is now known as the Berry phase is a quantum mechanical phase but it has a, a close a, a geometric or classical analog, which is displayed here on the, on the left. So here you can see a, a vector that is being transported on the surface of a sphere, making a closed loop. And this uh, transport is, uh, is done uh, uh, following two, two rules. The first rule is that the, the vector being transported must always stay uh, tangent to the surface. And the other rule is that the vector is not allowed to rotate uh, around the normal uh, direction normal to the sphere in this case. So uh, you see that after making a full loop, uh, the final orientation of this vector does not coincide with the initial orientation. And so that mismatch in orientation, that's the, the, the quantum counterpart of that is the very phase. And uh, in, in, the quant in, the very, in the case of the very phase, what is being transported are not just vectors, but rather states, quantum states in, in the Hilbert space. So let's be more concrete and uh, let's define what the, uh, the very phase is. So uh, consider a Hamiltonian that depends on an external parameter R. In general, that parameter can have many components. What could be an example? It could be the external magnetic field that you apply in the laboratory. Or it could be, if you're interested in the electronic system, it could be the nuclear coordinates. So, um, so then you have a Hamiltonian that depends on those parameters. And you can write a time independent uh, Schrodinger equation with some uh, eigenstates, uh, yeah. with some eigenstates uh, and also some eigenvalues that all depend on the parameter. N is the eigenstate label. Now suppose that you uh, uh, create an initial quantum state that is one of the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. Okay, so at time equals zero, uh, you create one of the, say you prepare the system in the nth eigenstates of the or eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And here the parenthesis zero, it means that we consider the values of the parameter at the initial time. So now we are gonna change those parameters as a function of time. So indeed, let's suppose that you're changing those parameters and you change them slowly in time so that you make a closed loop like here. And then the, the question that Barry asked is what is the quantum state after making a full loop after the vector R makes the full loop? So um, if the change in R is slow enough, then the final state at time equal capital T is the same as the initial state uh, uh, modulo a phase factor. 
And that phase has uh, two parts. And the first part is uh, well known to, to you all. It's just the uh, so-called dynamical phase. It's the integral of the energy eigenvalue over time between the initial time and the final time. So that's the uh, well-known phase. But Barry found that there is also another phase, another contribution to the phase that has this strange looking uh, shape. And uh, so, so this is called the Berry phase. Now, let me uh, tell you at least what, what's in here. So here you can see uh, the gradient operator with respect to parameters, which acts on the eigenstate. So the, if eigenstates depend on the parameters, then this gradient is not zero. And then you take, you sandwich it with the eigenstate itself. So this is a vector. This metric element is a vector because the gradient operator is a vector. And it has as many components as there are components in the vector R. Then you take a dot product with the infinitesimal length element dr along the path, and you integrate over the entire path and you multiply an i. So that's the Berry phase. Now, uh, uh, this Berry phase can be expressed in different ways. And uh, I will introduce some new quantities that are important that will allow me to rewrite this Berry phase in some different way. So the first uh, quantity that I'll introduce is the uh, Berry connection. That's just the same matrix element that I showed in the previous slide. Okay. So with this definition of the Berry connection, uh, you can write the Berry phase as the uh, line integral of the Berry connection uh, along the closed loop. Okay. It's just a definition. Now, uh, I'll now still re rewrite this in still in a different way. And for that, I'll introduce another quantity that is important is the uh, Berry curvature. So, uh, so far, uh, what I said is, is valid for a general parameter space that can be arbitrary, can have arbitrary dimensions. But now, just to simplify formula, let me just uh, focus on a three dimensional parameter space. Let's suppose that R is a 3D vector. Then the Berry curvature is just the, the curl of the Berry connection. And this N, uh, I didn't maybe mention it, but just remember that each eigenstate label has its own Berry curvature. So N is the eigenstate label. So now uh, with this definition, uh, you can use the invoke Stokes theorem uh, to write the line integral of the Berry connection as the flux of the curl of the Berry connection. So uh, namely the, the flux of the Berry curvature. Okay, so the Berry phase can be written as the flux of the Berry curvature over a surface. And that surface is one surface that uh, is delimited by the, by the path C. So one last quantity that I need to introduce is the, the churn number. The churn number, as you notice here, is also related to, uh, to the flux of the uh, very, very curvature over a surface. But in this case, the surface is closed. So it could be the surface of a sphere. It could be the surface of a torus. It's a surface that has no boundary, essentially. So it's a closed surface. Then you divide that quantity by 2 pi. And what you get is the, known as the churn number for the nth eigenstate. There is some theorem in mathematics that tells you that the churn number is an integer and it's moreover a topological invariant. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you now take your Hamiltonian and change it slightly, clearly the eigenstates will change. If the eigenstates change, the Berry curvature will change. However, the flux of the Berry curvature through a, a, over a, a closed surface will not change, even though you change the Hamiltonian. So that's, in that sense, it's an invariant. So if this is a bit strange, well, let me just remind you of familiar analogs that some of which were already mentioned by Professor San Zhang in his talk a couple of weeks ago. So the first one is Gauss's law of electromagnetism, which we, you all learned that if you evaluate the flux of the electric field over a closed surface and you multiply by the dielectric uh, uh, constant, what you obtain is the charge contained inside the surface. And that charge can be written as the electron charge times an integer. Okay, so there is also an integer related to this uh, this flux. Now, if you, for example, if you move the charges inside the surface without taking it out outside, clearly locally you are changing the electric field at the surface. However, the flux of the very of the electric field uh, is not is not changed. Okay? So it's an invariant. Likewise, if you take the surface and you deform it a bit. As long as the charges are the same inside the surface, 
you change the integration domain, but you don't change the, the value of this integral. So another example is the gauss bonnet theorem of in geometry, where you consider an object, there is on the surface of the object, uh, there is a Gaussian curvature, and then you integrate the Gaussian curvature over the, over the surface of the object. You divide by four pi, and what you find is one minus another integer. That in the integer is called the genus, and it corresponds to the number of holes that thread the object. So in the case of a sphere, the genus is zero. In the case of the torus, the genus is one. But once again, uh, if you take, for example, this sphere here, what you'll find that the, uh, this integral of the Gaussian curvature over the surface is equal to one. Okay, uh, divided by four pi is equal to one. Uh, but now if you deform this sphere, you are locally changing the Gaussian curvature. However, the integral doesn't change. So that's also an uh, invariant. So the churn number is an invariant like that. Now, uh, let me illustrate uh, these concepts, giving you two examples that I'll re return to later uh, in the seminar part of the talk. So let's talk about uh, the two-level quantum system in three-dimensional parameter space. So this could be, for example, a spinning and magnetic. So the Hamiltonian can be written as uh, your parameter vector dot product, the vector of Pauli matrices. Okay. This could also describe uh, wild fermions, for example. So it's a very simple Hamiltonian that uh, that can be diagonalized and what you obtain are like two eigenvalues, one positive and one negative. And the two eigenvalues become degenerate when the parameter value is zero. Uh, nearby is linear. So this is a very simple model and you can evaluate the Berry curvature analytically. And what you obtain is something interesting. So the Berry curvature for the positive and negative band is given by plus or minus the vector R divided by two times the modulus of R cube. If you remember in your uh, undergraduate electromagnetism courses, so this is modulo a prefactor is, is analogous to the electric field created by a point charge particle. Okay. Uh, the, the, the caveat here is that R here is not real space coordinate. It's actually a, it's a vector in parameter space, but otherwise it looks like a point charge located at the origin parameter space and creating some radial field. Or it could be the field, the magnetic field created by a magnetic monopole located at the origin, okay? So the degeneracy points, the, mess, the lesson here is that the degeneracy points between energy eigenvalues can be sources or sinks of the Berry curvature. And one can also compute the churn number. Uh, to compute the churn number, you have to take a closed surface. So here we're in three-dimensional parameter space, so we can take a 2D closed surface, like a sphere, for example. And then uh, what you find is that uh, the churn number for the positive or negative uh, eigenvalue is plus or minus one if uh, the surface encloses the degeneracy point. If the surface does not enclose the degeneracy point, then the churn number is zero, kind of like the Gauss's law. It counts the number of monopoles inside, inside the surface. Okay. Now let me give you another example. Uh, again, a two-level quantum system, but in this time, uh, in a two-dimensional parameter space. This is also an example that I'll uh, return to towards the end of the talk. So in this case, the, uh, the Hamiltonian can be again written as some uh, linear combination of Pauli matrices with the two components of the parameters, plus some other constant. That will, is not going to be some, will not make the variations on this parameter, just some n times sigma z. So this could describe, for example, two-dimensional massive Dirac fermions that, that appear uh, in some materials. So in this case, oh, I think uh, uh, the Berry curvature can also be computed analytically, and it turns out that it's directed towards the z, z direction, and it has this, this value. So it's a non-zero value. And the churn number uh, that you can evaluate uh, if if the uh, assuming that you have a periodic parameter space, namely, uh, how can you make a closed surface if you are in two dimensions? So, well, if the two dimensions are some periodic, you know, you have some kind of like a torus, and that is a closed surface. So, in that case, you find that the churn number is a plus or minus the sign of the m. Uh, yes. The spectrum of this Hamiltonian is it R squared plus M squared? Yeah, square root. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus or minus. 
So actually, I, I'm sorry, this uh, is here. In fact, I'm sorry, the animations didn't work. Out. I added this uh, this morning. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the spectrum. Yeah. So I was wondering if the gap pool right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if the gap is getting to zero, in this case, the very curvature. So um, as I was saying, uh, the very phase has had many much influence in many subfields of physics. But maybe the, the area where it has had the richest impact is that, that of quantum materials. So uh, should I close my camera? OK. Yeah. So let me talk about uh, uh, the very phase of, uh, of in materials. Uh, in fact, it turns out that the electrons in crystals uh, have also can have the very phase. Uh, in that case, uh, all the definitions that I gave you a couple of minutes ago still hold, except that the wave vector of the electrons plays the role of the, of the external parameter. It's not really external parameter, but still uh, you can define the very phase of electrons by using the R and replacing it with a, a wave vector of the electrons. And also the eigenstate index is just the electronic block band index. So uh, the very phase of electrons in crystal is known to lead to remarkable electronic effects. Uh, for example, uh, quantized hole and magnetoelectric effects. So you can have a, you can apply an electric field along X and there is a voltage drop along Y and the, the resistance is quantized uh, in units of uh, H over E square. And uh, so why is this quantization? Because it's related to the churn number of the, of the, uh, uh, of the system, so of the electronic system. So, uh, mm -hmm. So that's one spectacular manifestation. You can also have dissipationless charge transport on the edges or on the borders of insulators. And you can have also the systems with a non-zero electronic very phase. You can have the emergence of exotic quasi-particles such as axions and Majorana fermions, wild fermions, and quasi-particles that were first proposed in high energy physics, not observed there in that context yet, but they can manifest themselves in, in materials where electrons have non-zero very phase. However, uh, the purpose of my talk is, uh, is not to talk about the electronic effects produced by the very phase of electrons, but rather to talk about the influence of the very phase of electrons in non-electronic properties of crystals. And uh, the most ubiquitous example of a non-electronic quasi-particle in a crystal is a, it's a phonon. So I'll talk about phonons. And so phonons are quanta of lattice vibrations. And here we have a cartoon of a, a atomic lattice where you have atoms that are bonded by, by, by some strings. And so uh, due to thermal and quantum fluctuations, these atoms vibrate. And uh, uh, so you you're left with a problem of many coupled oscillators. But this problem can be solved by making some coordinate transformation. You can obtain the normal modes of this uh, coupled oscillator system. And those normal modes describe uh, collective excitations of all the atoms that are wave-like. So, uh, and the quanta of those normal modes are the phonons. Okay? So you all know that the, uh, the equation of motion for the normal modes is just the, that of a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, this is written in Fourier space, where uh, Q is the normal mode, uh, uh, U is the normal mode coordinate, uh, Q is the uh, normal mode wave vector, and omega is the normal mode uh, frequency. And then omega of Q is the uh, so-called phonon dispersion. This contains the details of the springs that connect the different atoms. So clearly, uh, the only non-trivial solution from this equation, the only solution with non-zero u, entails that omega has to be equal to omega q. So the frequency has to be equal to the phonon dispersion. Okay. Uh, for also later reference, let me point out that this equation of motion can be obtained by minimizing an action. Uh, so by taking the functional derivative of an action, with respect to the phonon normal coordinate and equal to zero, and that gives you that equation of motion. So uh, that action can be written as, uh, as shown here as an integral over all momenta and frequency of, of this quantity times u square. Okay, so you can easily see that the functional derivative equal to zero will give you the equation of motion uh, for the harmonic oscillator. And you will see this action in the end of the talk again. Okay, so. Uh, so this is all well known and you learn this in undergraduate physics, but it turns out that uh, lattice vibrations in crystals are not just simple harmonic oscillators like that. In fact, uh, they are uh, driven harmonic oscillators in general. Okay, so uh, the right-hand side of the equation is no longer zero in general. Uh, it, this is some kind of force, okay? 
the driving force. And that force can be written as a, a scalar product between a vector Q, capital Q, that is known as the phonon effective charge and the uh, electric field uh, that includes both external electric fields and internal electric fields. So uh, this is a quantity that, uh, that I didn't know about uh, when I started to think about this problem. So uh, back in 2016, so, that, uh, so that's something that maybe you don't learn in undergraduate courses, but it's, it's there. So. Uh, so just to get us familiar with this, let me define what the effective uh, phonon effective charge is. is by definition, is the change in the unit cell dipole moment uh, due to ion vibrations. So let me illustrate this definition with a, uh, with a cartoon. So this here is a unit cell of a crystal that contains four ions. There are two uh, uh, positively charged ions in black and two negatively charged ions in white. And they are vibrating out of their about their equilibrium positions. Uh, so the, those are the charges, and then this B one is the name of the of the vibrational mode. <clears throat> so this particular vibrational mode, you see that the, this positive charge is going up, and that one is going down. So it's just an instantaneous picture. Okay, so they are moving opposite. Therefore, the center of positive charge is is not moving. Now, when you look at the, uh, these two other negative charges, there are also one is moving up, the other one is moving down. So the center of negative charge is also not moving. And therefore, uh, this phonon mode doesn't involve any separation between positive and negative charges. It doesn't change the dipole moment of the unit cell. And therefore, the phonon effective charge for this mode is zero. Q equals zero. That Q is the phonon effective charge. Now, let's consider the same crystal, but a different phonon mode called A1. In this A1 vibrational mode, uh, here you have the two atoms that are moving, uh, positive atoms are moving up. So the center of positive charge is moving up. And these two negative uh, ions are moving down. So the center of negative charge is going down. So clearly you are separating positive and negative charges and that creates a dipole moment. So this phonon mode creates oscillations in the uh, electric dipole moment. And therefore uh, we say that the phonon effective charge for the A1 mode is non-zero. Now some nomenclature. If the phonon effective charge is zero, uh, we call that an infrared inactive mode. And if the uh, if the uh, charge is non-zero, maybe I didn't say it already. If the charge is zero, we call it infrared inactive. If the charge is not zero, we call it infrared uh, active mode. Why? Well, because the condition for a phonon to absorb a photon is the following uh, is that the uh, uh, polarization due to the phonon which is the phonon effective charge times the phonon displacement has to be non-orthogonal to the electric field of the light that's the p dot e coupling that we learn about okay so uh, clearly if the phonon effective charge is zero well this scalar product is zero so the, the, you cannot have a, a photon cannot absorb a phonon a phonon cannot absorb a photon but if the scalar product is non-zero, then, then you can, hence the name of inactive versus active. Okay, so now I come to the main question of this talk. Uh, so let's again, take a look at this equation uh, that describes uh, lattice vibrations in crystals. And the questions that I want to uh, address are the following. So what is the influence of the electronic very phase in the phonon effective charge, the phonon dispersion, and in the phonon normal coordinate? And that brings us again to the title page. Uh, so that concludes the uh, tutorial part of the talk. Uh, are there any questions? So now I'll begin with the seminar part of the talk. How am I doing with time? 11, okay. 11.30. So, uh, so we're in point three of the outline. And uh, now I'll give three examples on how the electronic berry phase uh, influences phonon properties. These three examples are each correspond to a research paper. So obviously I will skip the details. I'll try to just summarize the approach and the results and that, that's, that's it. Uh, so this work has been done in collaboration with a, a number of uh, students and postdocs uh, in my group. And also more recently in the, in the group of uh, Professor Chaoxin Liu at Penn State University. So how does the very phase of electrons appear or influence the phonon effective charge? Well, it turns out that this question can be more transparently or more easily addressed in a type of material 
that is known as a wilds and metal. So wilds and metals are uh, uh, semi-metals in which the electronic energy as a function of the wave vector hosts some uh, degeneracy points in isolated places in the Brillouin zone. There is a theorem that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, around those two points, uh, 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 the dispersion of the, the band dispersion is linear. So there is a theorem that tells you that uh, these degeneracy points must always appear in pairs. So this is the minimal, the simplest situation. Okay. Now, uh, from part one of the talk, uh, oh, I should say, uh, in general, these two uh, degeneracy points need not happen at the same energy. So we will call the energy difference uh, P naught. And they also need not happen at the same wave vector. So we will denote the wave vector difference as, uh, as B vector. So now uh, from uh, referring to part one of the talk, you know that uh, when you have this kind of linear band crossings that those will be sources or sinks of the very curvature. So there is very curvature uh, associated to the both degeneracy points. But interestingly, the very curvatures are uh, equal in magnitude and opposite in sign for the two, uh, for the two nodes. <clears throat> and now you may ask, okay, what is the impact of the very curvature in physical properties? Uh, so first thing to recognize is that if both B naught and B vector were zero, then the two uh, degeneracy points will be superimposed okay? in energy and in wave vector. And the very curvatures will tend to cancel each other. Okay? So in order to have very curvature some net effect, we need either one to be at least non-zero. And one, uh, maybe the main physical manifestation is that uh, in the electromagnetic response, uh, okay? through what is known as the axion term of the electromagnetic Lagrangian. So you know from electromagnetism that there is, electric, uh, there is energy stored in the electric field that goes like the electric field square. There is also energy stored in magnetic field that goes like magnetic field square. And those appear in the Lagrangian. But uh, in some materials, such as in wild and metals, there is also another kind of term that appears in the electromagnetic Lagrangian that involves a scalar product between the electric field E and the magnetic field B. In the, and that's called the axial term. In the case of uh, wilds and metals, this coefficient theta is known to have this expression, okay, where alpha is the fine structure constant, one divided by 137. And then uh, you recognize the vector B that separates the two nodes in wave vector space and the, uh, and the scalar B naught that separates the two degeneracy points in energy. And what is R? R is just the position and T is the time. Okay, so that's that's the axiom term, uh, in the, uh, and that's a consequence. You can think of it uh, of these uh, band crossings uh, uh, that also lead to the very curvature. How do you determine the direction of Of which B? Yeah, it's not directly. Yeah, so that's that the distance between, uh, say, a positive chirality node and negative chirality node. Yeah. Does it matter? I think it shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, you mean positive to negative or negative to positive? Yeah, I don't, I don't recall. Uh, it will be a sign difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And R is now really the position that way. That's right. This is really the position. Yeah. So the electromagnetic manifestation of this can be obtained by just adding them to the electromagnetic. Uh, uh, Lagrangian, then calculating the Maxwell's equations, and then you obtain interesting things such as anomalous Hall effect, namely a uh, Hall effect in the absence of external magnetic fields that is produced by this B vector here. Uh, you also obtain chiral magnetic effect that comes from B naught. Chiral magnetic effect means that uh, you apply, uh, there is a current that flows parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, yes. Well, what are the symmetry requirements to help this problem? Right, so, so yeah, so this requires broken time reversal and that requires broken inversion and mirrors. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> uh, Fermi level will uh, uh, not intersect the two, in that case, it will not intersect the two degeneracy points, it will intersect it. Uh, like it will be the same for the two, right? Uh, the same, uh, yeah. So the Fermi level is independent of momentum, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, but 
but the Fermi level measure from the degeneracy point need not be the same for the two nodes. Yeah, you could have different densities uh, in the two nodes. Yeah. And also, uh, it leads to this leads to the negative longitudinal magnetic resistance. It means that if you have an electric, uh, if you have an electric field and a magnetic field that are collinear, then the system, the conductivity of the system increases as you increase the strength of the magnetic field. So that's known as the negative longitudinal magnetic resistance. That's also ultimately follows from this kind of term. But those are electronic manifestations. What I'm interested in is in, in phononic manifestations of, of this term. And so uh, let's concentrate on the uh, phonon effective charge. <clears throat> so again, coming back to the definition, the phonon effective charge is the change in the uh, uh, electric polarization of the unit cell with respect to the phonon normal coordinate. Okay? But now you recall from electromagnetism that uh, the polarization can be written as the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to electric field. So this is simply the second derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, U and E. So from this very simple formula, you can already anticipate what's the contribution from the axion term to the phonon effective charge. Okay, and we'll call that contribution. We will call it a Q ax. Okay, so Q ax is just uh, the second derivative respect to U and E of the axion Lagrangian theta e dot b. So when you take the derivative respect to E, well that E goes away. When you take the derivative respect to U, uh, you get d theta d u. So the message here is that uh, if by chance this coefficient theta depends on the phonon coordinate, then a magnetic field, an external magnetic field that you can apply in the laboratory will induce a phonon effective charge. And moreover, that phonon effective charge will be parallel to the magnetic field. So our work was essentially to do a microscopic theory of d theta du, and I will skip, skip that. I'll just try to give some intuition on, on when, and for which kind of situations this derivative is not zero. It turns out that it's not zero for phonons that can be called pseudo-scalar or pseudo-vector phonons. So let me tell you what those are. Okay. So again, recall that the coefficient theta involved B dot R minus B zero times time, where B naught is the, the energy separation between the degeneracy points and B vector is the momentum separation or wave vector separation between the degeneracy points. So now uh, include phonons in the story. So Phonons coupled to electrons okay, due to Coulomb interactions. So phonons and lattice vibrations are coupled to electrons. And so they will, if you consider long wavelength phonons, essentially it corresponds to a vibrations of the electronic uh, energy levels. Okay? They will start to change in time due to coupling to phonons. And you can imagine a particular kind of phonon that will create fluctuations in B naught like this. Okay? So if you have a phonon that does that, then B naught will be a function of the phonon coordinate. And if B naught is a function of phonon coordinate, then the de derivative of theta with respect to U is not zero. Okay. Now, this, this, uh, the phonons that do this, uh, they're called the pseudo-scalar phonons. Uh, you could have another kind of phonon as well that doesn't create fluctuations in B naught, but it creates fluctuations in the separation uh, between the, uh, the, the degeneracy points like that. So if you have that kind of phonon, then this B vector is also a function of the normal coordinate. And the derivative of theta respect to U wouldn't be zero, okay? So that's a pseudo vector phonon. So these are the kind of phonons that will, uh, will be interesting for us, okay? Is, the, is that second kind of phonon more likely to be lattice? Right. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, yeah, so here uh, I have to say that this picture is kind of, at least this cartoon is for very long wavelength phonons. Uh, so if you have a long wavelength acoustic phonons, they don't couple to electrons much. So yeah, so this is mainly for optical phonons. Yeah. yeah. Also the, the effective charge that I talk about, the phonon effective charge, essentially zero for uh, long wavelength acoustic phonons, but it's not zero for optical phonons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so this is, I would say, mainly applicable for optical phonons. Yeah. Uh, okay, very good. So uh, the physical manifestation will be a, a magnetic field induced. Okay, Michel. Michel, you have a question? Yes. Um, so I thought that bond effective charge are not possible in metallic systems because you know it's the um, the bond effective charge is 
which is kind of the charge you have here, is the derivative of the polarization with respect to motion of atoms, uh, but you don't have polarization in the magnetic systems. So in the wild semi-metals, it is a metallic system to start with. So, uh, yes, so, so these are uh, dynamical, dynamical, uh, uh, dynamical effective charges. So uh, uh, they are not, uh, they are not, how do you say, uh, uh, suppressed uh, due to screening. Yeah, uh, they're they're dynamical. So th these effective charges that I'm going to talk about, they are frequency and wave vector dependent effective charges. They're not uh, constant. Yeah. In that state. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so in fact, yeah, the frequency dependence is in fact key. Yeah. Okay, very good. So um, I don't know how to remove that thing. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so um, a physical manifestation of this would be a magnetic field induced infrared absorption. So, suppose we have one of these pseudo scalar optical phonons of frequency omega naught. That is infrared inactive, namely no effective phonon charge, in the absence of external magnetic field. And then let's shine some light on this uh, wild semi metal and let's measure the absorption of the light as a function of the frequency of the light. And because the, uh, it's infrared inactive, you don't expect any particular features happening at the frequency of the phonon. That is the case at zero external magnetic field. Now let's turn on the magnetic field. If you turn on the magnetic field through the uh, mechanism that I just talked about, there will be a, a phonon effective charge that will be non-zero, and therefore the, there can be a peak in the absorption. Uh, but it's not just, it's not enough to have a non-zero magnetic field. You also remember that you need to have the polarization of the phonon non-orthogonal to the electric field of the, of the light. And because the phonon effective charge is parallel to the magnetic field, you need the external magnetic field to be non-orthogonal to the electromagnetic field of the light. And this is something that is easily tunable in experiment. You know, you can change the polarization of the of the of the light, change the direction of E electromagnetic for B fixed. So, so you can play with that. And in fact, uh, this, this prediction was experimentally validated uh, uh, last year. Well, at least then that's, that was the claim. Yeah. What was the in niobium uh, arsenal. <laughs> Okay. So that's an example of a non trivial phonon behavior due to the very phase of electrons. Now, let me move, to, let me move to another example, and time is running out. So, uh, uh, so let's talk about the uh, sound propagation. Uh, so sound propagation can be uh, essentially described by invoking Hooke's law. So let's define uh, the ion displacement with respect to equilibrium position. That's a vector u. And then we can write uh, Newton's second law, which is the mass density times the acceleration of the ions equals some uh, uh, force. Uh, this actually uh, R is the position. And here, sigma plus delta sigma, that's the stress stress tensor. And I'm uh, omitting the tensor indices just for brevity, okay? So this stress tensor, I sort of uh, separated in two parts. Uh, one is the uh, contribution that could come from, say, core electrons, uh, electrons that are very much localized near the ions. And the other one's more like uh, the uh, contribution from the valence electrons. So that's where the very phase uh, effects appear. And if this was a normal blackboard, I could have uh, added some e little equations, but uh, uh, because we uh, don't have a blackboard here, can I write? Anybody know who to talk? Okay, raised. Okay, so if I write here, do people see it uh, everywhere? Okay, so so essentially, uh, let me just uh, briefly say how do we, we calculate this delta sigma. So uh, that's what we calculate theoretically. So first, uh, we evaluate the change in the. You're still in the raised remote. Uh -huh. I think it causes. Uh, 
Uh, so we evaluate the change in the uh, energy of an electron with momentum p uh, due to a uh, lattice distortion that can be written as in the simplest model uh, some deformation potential times the gradient of the times the gradient of the displacement okay and uh, of course if the displacement was uniform then there is no no effect in the energy of electrons. It's just that rigid translation of the crystal. So, so you need to have some gradient of displacement. So that's the change in the energy of one electron. But then uh, if you want to look at the change in energy of all the electrons, uh, uh, you can write that as uh, uh, integral over momenta of a uh, little uh, of Delta epsilon of uh, and sum over momenta of the, uh, and this is the uh, f of p is the occupation factor of, of that electronic state. Okay, so this is the, the delta capital E is the change in the total energy of the electrons due to coupling to the to the lattice. And here, uh, this in general is a function of uh, u. Uh, the distribution function of electron is a function of the of the sound wave. Okay, so what we do is we calculate this f from the Boltzmann equation. And okay, but uh, so that distribution function that we calculate contains explicitly the very curvature, and that's how. Uh, okay, I need, I need to make the last connection. Uh, uh, we can get the delta sigma here in this equation as uh, the derivative of the delta e uh, with respect to the gradient of uh, divergence of u. Okay, so that's the definition of delta sigma. So essentially, the very curvature appears in Fermi uh, in the distribution function, and then uh, we compute uh, delta sigma in this way. Okay, so I'll just show you what happens uh, as a result of the calculation. So the physical manifestation of that uh, uh, very uh, uh, of that calculation is really the phonon magnetochiral effect. So this is okay. Now I should erase. Now I understand why everybody uses clothes. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. So, um, so the phonon magnetochiral effect is actually easy to, uh, to define. Uh, suppose you have a sine wave that is propagating in a magnetic field. And so on the left, uh, the sound wave goes parallel to the magnetic field. And on the right, the same, same sound wave goes anti parallel to the magnetic field. And now, if the sound velocity in both cases is different, that's the phonon magnetochiral effect. Now, this, uh, is from a symmetry point of view, uh, having a, such an effect requires some reduced symmetry of the crystal, like broken space inversion of mirrors, like, for example, in chiral crystals. And even though this effect is easy to, easy to explain, actually, it's hard to measure. Uh, the difference between V and V prime can be just a few parts in a million. So uh, the first measurement of this effect uh, took in bulk took place only in 2019. And that took place in, in some chiral magnets uh, in which uh, the magnetic order has some chirality or handedness. And that handedness is communicated to the acoustic wave through the magnetoelastic couple. So that was the mechanism. It's an electrical insulator uh, uh, that was, uh, in which this was observed. But what we proposed is that this effect can also occur in conductors, and moreover, it can occur in uh, chiral wild semimetals, wild semimetals without mirror and uh, inversion symmetries, of which examples exist, such as uh, cobalt silicide. And in those uh, materials, what is remarkable is that the difference between V and V prime is proportional to uh, the churn number of the electrons uh, in, the, in, the, in the system. Now, more precisely, what is this churn number? Remember, churn number was the flux of the very curvature over a closed surface. Here, what is the closed surface? It's the very, I'm sorry, it's the Fermi, uh, Fermi surface that encloses the, the generosity point. That's, that's, uh, so that appears uh, directly in this V minus V prime. Then you have this scalar product between a phonon wave vector and the external magnetic field that explains why V minus V prime will change sign when the relative direction between Q and V changes sign. And then you have this D, which is the electron-phonon coupling. 
and uh, some tau v, which is electron lifetime. So this uh, theoretical prediction has not been experimentally uh, validated so far. Okay. So just to, uh, uh, I'm approaching the end of the talk. Now, let me give you the third and the last example of how electronic verifiers can influence phonon properties. So this is now is about the phonon angular momentum. So I'll concentrate on a particular kind of material, even though the ideas that I, I'll show can be more generally valid. And the particular prototype material that I'll focus on is barium manganese antimony. So this is a layered material, which have layers of barium atoms, manganese atoms, and antimony atoms. According to electronic structure calculations, the low energy states, electronic states, mainly originate from the uh, antimony planes. So let's look at those uh, antimony planes. And when you look at those antimony planes, you find these zigzag uh, chains in which you have two inequivalent antimony uh, atoms. Okay, so that's the antimony plane. Now let's look at the uh, electronic structure calculated in, in some DFT calculate. Uh, uh, approaches. So the electronic structure uh, is shown here. The color stands for the spin orientation or spin density of for those states. Yeah. Uh, zero is the Fermi energy. Okay. So first thing to recognize is that these are kind of quasi 2D electronic bands. There is very little dispersion in the Z axis. Uh, now that's due to the layered structure of the material. So we can almost think of this as a 2D material. The other observation is that uh, close to the Fermi energy, you have this kind of a, almost a band degeneracy. Okay? The gaps are small on the order of a few tens of MeV. Uh, but um, uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, the dispersion here is the, the dispersion that I showed in the first part of the talk is the dispersion of uh, parabolic close to the gap and then linear. So that's like a, a 2D Dirac fermions uh, with a mass, like graphene, but with a mass. And from the, in, uh, remembering what I told you in the, in the tutorial part, uh, there is a very curvature associated to this, this band structure. And the question is, how does that very curvature alter the phonon properties? Okay, so the phonons that are most uh, immediately altered are the ones that involve vibrations of the antimony ions. Okay, more particular, uh, the in plane optical phonons uh, for these antimony ions. And I, I just described two such modes. Uh, the first one, uh, we'll call it mode A, in which the two antimony ions are uh, vibrating out of phase, but they're vibrating along the X axis. So this is a, a phonon mode that is linearly polarized along X. And the corresponding displacement, let's call it U of A. Then there is a, another mode that we'll call a, a mode B. And in that mode, the two antimony ions are also vibrating out of phase, it's an optical phonon, uh, but they are vibrating along the y direction. So this is a phonon mode that is linearly polarized along y. And the corresponding displacement we'll call U of B. Okay, very good. And now two important aspects for these modes. The first one is that they're a non-degenerate. So uh, they don't have the same frequency, even at a zero wave vector, they don't have the same frequency. And that's because this crystal doesn't have 90 degree rotational symmetry around the C-axis. So these two modes have different phonon frequencies. And another, uh, maybe more mysterious uh, statement that I will not prove here is that these modes couple in a special way to the Dirac fermions that I told you about. They couple to them as if they were some effective electromagnetic potentials. Okay. And now those of you who are experts, you know that uh, when electromagnetic potentials couple to massive Dirac fermions, then the back action in those electromagnetic potentials is a churn simons like term. And the churn simons terms are responsible for the quantum Hall effect, for example. Okay. So uh, something similar will happen here, but not for the true electromagnetic field, but for actual phonons, which are responsible for these uh, effective or fictitious electromagnetic potentials. Okay, so now let's go to the main result. Uh, Let's look at the phonon dynamics uh, for these two modes. Uh, so I write the action that I introduced in the first part of the talk. Uh, here is the action for the first phonon mode A. That's the action for the second phonon mode B. 
and uh, omega a and omega b are just the frequencies of decoupled uh, a and b modes but now it turns out that because phonons couple to electrons like uh, i'm sorry like uh, yeah phonons couple to electrons like electromagnetic potentials then there is a, a another term in the action that is known as the chern simons term okay so uh, how does it look like well it looks like this has some universal constants electron charge squared divided by Planck's constant and then you have the sign of m and if you remember from the first part of the talk the sign of m is the chern number okay chern number of electrons and then you have these two constants that's the uh, electron phonon couplings that appear and then you have uh, an integral over q and omega of something that involves mixture between a and b so this chern simons term is hybridizing a and b phonon modes it's connecting them and the hybridization amplitude scales with the uh, y component of the phonon momentum uh, phonon wave vector and it's, it's also imaginary okay so that's really quite kind of remarkable uh, and that leads to uh, the physical manifestation that uh, can be defined as a phonon helicity so what is that well first let's recap let's remember that electron phonon coupling hybridizes a and b phonon modes and the hybridization involves an imaginary number i and it's linear in the phonon momentum q of y and, but now remember phonon a uh, was li linearly polarized along x phonon b was linearly polarized along, along y and if you hybridize the two with an i well you get circular polarization right uh, okay now strictly speaking this shouldn't be circular uh, it's more elliptical because uh, the two phonon modes don't have the same frequency okay so then it's the amplitudes are not exactly the same here okay but it's, it's schematic but in reality it will be elliptical elliptical phonon and what happens if all of a sudden you change the phonon wave vector you reverse it well then i goes to minus y okay and then you get also elliptically polarized with the opposite polarization so um, uh, so you get elliptical phonons and elliptical phonons means they have some non-zero angular momentum, okay? And the phone, this angular momentum is reversed, as I mentioned, when QI goes to minus QI. Because of that, we, uh, we call it some uh, helical phonon. So that's analog to a, uh, maybe let's summarize here. So, so if this is the phonon frequency and this is the wave vector, uh, then you have some, the optical phonon, the same effect, happens for acoustic I think but uh, not I think it happens but uh, uh, so if you look at say a uh, phonon here uh, you can have a some elliptical polarization that way and when you look at the negative uh, it has the elliptical polarization the other way okay so that's that's uh, you get some kind of angular momentum texture in momentum space like electrons with Rajvan spin orbit coupling, for example, uh, when you have electronic states in, with spin orbit, you, you can have spin densities that change with as a function of K. So it's something analogous to that, and therefore we call uh, helical phonons. Uh, as of now, there is no experimental validation of, the, of this, of this uh, effect. So let me come to the conclusions. It's already time. Uh, uh, the message of this talk is that the phonons in crystals uh, inherit non-trivial properties from the electronic very phase, hence the title uh, is inherit. And, uh, and sometimes that those non-trivial properties come from churn numbers of electrons that are topologically invariant. Okay? And I've shown you three examples. Uh, the first one was the uh, phonon magnetocardial effect. I'm sorry, not the phonon magnetocardial effect. The first one was the magnetic field induced infinite absorption. The second one was the phonon magnetocardial effect. And the third one was the phonon helicity. Uh, two and three have not been experimentally verified. So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe if we are lucky, there might be other examples waiting to be discovered. So, with that, thank you for your attention. Sorry for the. Hi, uh, nice talk. So, um, I had a question about the magnetic field and use infrared absorption. So I, I looked up the experimental uh, verification of that paper uh, and uh, I saw the, the magnetic field strands used are something on the order of 10 Tesla, which is a bit high. Uh, are there systems where, uh, where that field strength might be pushed lower? So in the, in the one or two Tesla regime? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh... Uh, in principle, this effect is linear in the magnetic field strength. So the stronger the magnetic field, the better. 
and mm -hmm. I don't know what. Uh, so one has to estimate what's the. Uh, so we actually did some estimates uh, uh, in our paper. Uh, what would be the quantitative number for this uh, uh, magnetic field induced phonon effective charge? I don't recall now off of my head exactly the numbers that we thought about, but it seems to me that for uh, you know, at least you need to have a one percent of an electron charge to be able to measure this. 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 So that tells you what's the minimal value of the of the magnetic field. It also, of course, depends on the, the strength of the electron phonon coupling. The stronger the electron phonon coupling, the bigger the effect will be, and the lesser the magnetic field that you need. So. Uh, okay. And it also depends on the frequency of the phonon mode. Uh, yeah. So the. Right. Uh, I believe the lower the frequency. Uh, well, I don't recall how it depends, but yeah. So it depends on it depends on actually on material parameters. Yeah, you, yeah usually usually the lower the better for electron. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, nice talk, and thank you for the introduction. I'm sure a lot of students here at McGill really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to ask. Since you have this, um, these bands that have the elicity, um, the chirality for the phonons, can you see also the hallmark of uh, topology, which is uh, localization? So can you see, can you trap a phonon uh, or localize it somehow? You mean some kind of like a phonon edge states or? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's also another thing. Uh, I think that uh, uh, some, yeah, so this we didn't look at, but uh, when you induce this kind of phonon angular momentum textures, it's possible that phonons themselves will have better curvature. And if you break the universal symmetry, it's possible that the phonon bands will have finite churn number. And then you can have like, uh, you know, like phonon edge states, uh, for example. Yeah. So there was a very recent paper by uh, Chan Niu, in fact, uh, in which they do something tantalizingly similar. Uh, they consider Haldane model of electrons coupled to phonons. And they find that phonon bands acquire a uh, churn number due to the uh, electrons. So that's something that is, yeah, I think goes along along your question if I understand correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Philip, Philip St. John. Yes, uh, well, thank you. Thank you also, um, Ian, for your really nice talk. Um, so, so uh, all you showed was uh, related to to the dipolar moment uh, of the uh, inside the unit cell, but but um, we can push this expansion uh, further, like have looking at the quadrupolar octopole moment uh, in the unit cell, and a little bit like what is done in higher order topological insulators. Could there be are, are there some inside of interesting physics that could uh, occur uh, in these uh, higher order modes? You mean in higher order topological insulators? No, for example, if, if you push this uh, the, this coupling to not only to the dipolar moment but to okay. the quadrupole moment, to the uh... are those measured? Are the higher order? Uh... Yes, yes, they are. Okay, okay, yeah. So I'd be I'd be interested to know more about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't know. I don't know how. For example, yeah, the leading order is the phonon effective charge. I guess that's the yeah. Yes, exactly. So, but if, if you if you look at Zero. Some materials have zero dipolar moment, so you can go to the quadrupolar moment. Uh, and, and, and I see. So, so yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to know, learn more about okay. that. Yeah. So if you can send me some some references, uh, that would be, be cool. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I will. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your talk. Yeah. Dennis. Thank you very much, Ian. I have two questions, if there is time. One, maybe just a quick intuition check question. So when you talked about this pseudo vector uh, 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 phonon, uh, are you can I think of it essentially as kind of a phonon mode with a k vector that is inverse to the one over b term, which was this vector of separation uh, of these two? No, actually no. Uh, so this would be a, a zero wave vector phonon uh, that can do that. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. not, you don't need to have phonon wave vector equal to the distance between the two. Uh, uh, okay, so, so then what, what is the, so how does this picture then, uh, so. I think of it, the, uh, yeah. So the results that you presented were in some sense in Q, K equals zero 
so how, how does this picture then evolve for a finite K? Um, what what yeah. kind of corrections are brought about? And I have then another question, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start mm -hmm. that. Yeah, so, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, essentially the first part and the second, the first two results, uh, infrared absorption is essentially zero wave vector optical phonons. And that's because photons have very small wave vectors. So you only excite phonon modes that uh, are you only, only phonon modes with very long wavelengths participate. Hence, it was relevant to consider a zero wave vector. For the magnetochiral effect, again, uh, what is measured in the experiment is uh, saying ultrasound uh, uh, attenuation or uh, propagation experiments are phonons with very, very long wave vectors. So we concentrated in essentially almost zero wave vector phonons. Uh, for helicity though, it turns out that the uh, finite phonon wave vector increases the, the magnitude <laughs> of the effect. So if you don't have any phonon wave vector, the phonon helicity goes to zero. The bigger the wave vector, the bigger the helicity that we find. Okay. And so, so in that sense, for the third effect, I think increasing the wave vector is a good thing. And, but then of course our theory is not valid uh, when the phonon wave vector is large also. So, um, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm coming back to the intuition of that pseudo vector, you can think of it, you know, these two wild nodes are separated in momentum due to some magnetic order. You have to break time versus symmetry. So think of that separation as being proportional to some magnetization. And now think of the phonon as being some kind of magnetoelastic coupling that will create fluctuations in the magnitude of the magnetization. That will okay. also lead to the fluctuation in the separation between the the uh, the generacy points in the wild nodes and in okay. the wild semimetal. So that's right. the kind of intuition. Yeah. Okay. And then maybe my second question, if there's time, coming back to this K dependence. Let's say you're not. In the, in the first two, you're not maybe interested so much in this infrared absorption, but still kind of magnetic field and use effects. So maybe thinking more of a Polaron story or maybe even of a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, 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 Cooper pair even. Uh, so so what, what kind of nuances you would expect to be brought about once you turn on the K dependence, in, particularly in these first two parts of the story? Right. So, um, yeah. So, so I, I think that um, the phonon magnetochiral effect also will increase in magnitude once you increase the wave vector. Yeah, I don't recall actually. Yeah, uh, uh, probably. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there will be new qualitative effects at larger wave. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. Uh, there is one thing that I forgot to say that there is some effect coming here. Uh, so for the first, uh, for the first result, uh, if if the uh, Fermi, if the slope of the the velocity of the uh, wild fermions v, you know, they have a linear dispersion, so some slope with uh, velocity v, okay, times the uh, phonon wave vector uh, magnitude equals uh, equals the phonon frequency. Then you have something special, some kind of pol polar uh, polariton-like effect happening. Mm -hmm. Is that something uh, that you're asking? Well, I, I I'm just trying to learn. Uh, okay, uh, so, that's so pretty this, cool. Um, this is an effect that I didn't talk about that appears at larger wave vectors. You see, uh, you need to have a wave vector that is equal to the, uh, the frequency of the optical phonon divided by the Fermi velocity. Okay, okay. cool. And then right. you you have actually some hybridization effects. Uh, that are also discussed in this paper, but I didn't I didn't talk about that. That also hasn't been experimentally experimentally observed. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Ça va. D'autres questions? Ben, sinon, merci encore.